10 Le Mans 24 hour wins between them. Please welcome Alan McNish and Tom Christensen. Apologies, we weren't concentrating. In fact, I've lost my teammate. Tom, the, the hole in the curtain's in the middle, Chief. Oh. Sorry. For about three years, we've managed to lose Tom at most races and tests to the point that uh, there's a general joke of where's Tom? And this was another, uh, another example, fine example. Uh, Happy New Year, chaps. Welcome to the show. Tom, a year ago, almost to the day, you were on crutches, weren't you? Hobbling around after a nasty <laughs> shunt. Yeah, yeah, I was basically uh, learning that I'm not 20-ish uh, anymore. Uh, training hard last winter to prepare the season and then um, I played badminton with my older son. And uh, first set went really well. Second set, he got in front and, uh, and won that one. So we had a third set and he was leading and I had really to get going and then I tore my Achilles completely. Um, and, uh, and he won the match. I love the way he says like, he was leading while playing badminton. Is that the most ridiculous way to injure yourself? Imaginable, playing badminton. It's very close, but it's, uh, it's definitely very humiliating. You s you're there on the, obviously, the wrong side of the net, and Oliver just returned the, returned the ball and said 4-1, um, and I'm in pain. And I said I couldn't, re I couldn't walk, couldn't get up again. And uh, obviously, to have, a, to have my son looking for uh, assistance for me and, uh, and to get me into the doctor, that's quite humiliating. And um, it turned out well. They did a good job, and it was nice to, to see the guys. I think on uh, April the 5th, I was in the car again, or April 7th, something like that, just to, uh, to actually to move the car and take part in the race in, uh, in Spa the, a, a, a few weeks later. Did you have any problems with that, uh, with that injury during the season? Um, no, in the car not. The problem was that it's a, my, it was my left Achilles, and obviously to um, to press the clutch in a in a in a sports car, and the clutch is really heavy. Obviously, it has to last over Le Mans. You know, you have to shut down the engine when you are refueling or when you're in the pit lane. So obviously, all the starts in uh, out of the pits, you use the clutch, and it has to obviously to endure 24 hours. So it's a it's a very heavy thing, and um, it took me many weeks to be able to. Uh, move the the clutch pedal. Um, uh, that was the, the the main thing. Then for sure, I've been I've been a part of the ministry of silly walks through the summer when we did our running uh, theme. It, I was sort of stumbling uh, around, but now it's um, it feels quite good. It's strange, but I can run like you would say. It looks normal, but it feels different because it's uh, at the moment it's only my left Achilles I have done. I'm looking forward for the right one so it can be all up in place. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I should say, you will get an opportunity to put a question to Alan or Tom. So have a think of something uh, taxing for them, something that we don't cover. David Harris is going to be out there with a microphone at some point. So uh, any good uh, questions for Alan or Tom uh, in a moment? Alan, uh, R15 uh, Plus is consigned to history. Got a new car. Uh, not for really. We, for the first race, Sebring, we're with the R15 again. Oh. So it's not totally confined to history, but the R18 definitely is the, the car that we're looking forward to. And uh, it's got a roof. Yes. It's the first Audi prototype to have a roof for it's got the steering on years. the correct side as well. You've tested it, haven't you? Yep. How no, was it's, it? uh, it's a closed car. The regulations have changed so much at Le Mans that uh, Audi felt that there was no other alternative to go with a closed car for aerodynamic uh, efficiency. Also, the other thing is that we've got a much smaller engine, a little V6, 3.7 litre. And uh, we've got the steering wheel on the right side, so there's quite a few changes. And like you say, it's 1999, I think, Tom? Yeah. Where uh, the when Audi year, had a, a closed car before. And yeah, I, I did the first test and Tom did the second. And I, I have to say, it, it took a little bit of getting used to, but it, at the end of the day, it's a racing car. It's got a steering wheel, it's got a seat, it's got an engine, and you know, it's, you just turn and go. You make it sound easy. Yeah, well, it is, but... Uh, not really. No, it's, it's definitely we're different. We're all disagreeing there's, with you. There's no question. It is definitely different. But uh, right now, we're very early in the development process of it. Uh, we haven't uh, started our major tests yet. And uh, that's really, I think, when we're going to get a true feel for it. But uh, it, it's done everything so far exactly as it should. Just explain for anybody who's not a, a real sports car aficionado, the regulations, they've changed. What's the difference between having a roof and not having one? 
Um, you don't get wet when it rains is one of the very obvious That's ones. The so there's, only there's quite a lot of differences. Basically, if you think of Le Mans, there's five times per lap where you're over 200 miles per hour. And so you need to have the car that is as slippery as possible on the straights. You also need to produce downforce for the corners because uh, there's a tremendous amount of high-speed corners like the Porsche curves where we're doing 170 mile an hour through there. And uh, it's that compromise, that balance. And in the past, the regulations uh, were allowing a lot of mechanics for the pit stops. And so therefore pit stop time for the driver changes was very important. Now that's changed. Pit stops are much longer because of regulation changes. So driver changes aren't so critical. And uh, with the, the smaller displacement engines, it means that we have to try to gain back and also 65 liters of fuel tank instead of 80. We have to try to gain back all of these things that we had before in a different way. And so therefore they've gone for a slippery uh, closed cockpit car. There's less negatives from it, and there's definitely much more positives. And they also, with the small engine as well, we've got a good little weight distribution as well. So it's all in all, it's a package. It's not just one part of it, but it's a big package. And Tom, those, um, those awful people from Peugeot, I'll say it quietly, Peugeot, they've got a roof on their car as well. So you're kind of uh, on as even now. Yeah, but I mean, Alan said that. I mean, there was no way uh, back with the regulation, especially because of the pit stop. And that actually happened two years ago. But at that, part, at that stage, Audi had already was too fine the plans with the R15 because it would have been made sense that we would have come with a roof two years ago in that, in that sense because of the, um, the speed down the straights. And their closed car uh, definitely has quite a huge benefit. What you saw in a classic race like 2008, where we were, um, where they were fast over one lap, but we won the race. And especially as at Le Mans, you have to go through the night. You have to take all the weather uh, situations into account. In 2008, with the rain during the night uh, and the pit stops, and uh, we were we were putting a lot of pressure on them, especially when there was the pit stop during the nights where we we were simply faster doing them before they always lost a second or three before they closed the door and went again. But obviously, the last two years, you need to have a closed car. And for this year, it's the biggest change of regulation uh, for the for technical side uh, for over 10 years. And it's um, obviously, it's downsizing, it's efficiency. Um, and ACO thinks they can get lap times higher than 3.30 again. And uh, the engineers and us drivers, we are working and that we will keep them still still below. We're seeing that across all forms of motorsport, aren't we? The downsizing uh, in, in aid of efficiency. Formula One is going to go four-cylinder, 1600 turbo, perhaps. Um, uh, rally cars are now 1600, not two-litre. Is it something, this dumbing down of power and, and, and uh, that sort of thing, is that, is that a bit dull for a driver? Um, if, yeah, in, in, in a way, yes. But on, on the other side, it's, 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 it, it is uh, that you keep... Uh, the basic, um, the, the first, the, the, the first thought it is, but then you, it's the same thing you have to go through, and to make it more uh, efficient, you have to uh, have more attention to detail. Obviously, what it means for a circuit like Le Mans is that we have to run less aero to gain the the best compromise. It means speed and uh, um, and, and lap times, and for just looking at purely at the race at Le Mans, the lap times last year was incredible fast. It was the fastest race in Le Mans history. And that means now it's a circuit with a lot of corners, a lot of chicanes. But it took them many years to bring, beat that record from 1971 when the circuit was very fast, more or less um, a big oval with a, few, with a few braking areas. Now it's obviously it's a proper tough circuit. And um, to go that fast last year, we had to do something. It was simply being too fast for the good of it. So I think for Le Mans, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the right way. It maintains that you need efficiency because you want to have, uh, with a small fuel tank that Alan mentioned, you need really to, uh, to do your homework correctly to be fast and, um, and reliable. Alan, you know, Tom mentioned 2008, that was a great race. Was that a, a, a relief for you to finally get uh, Le Mans win number two under your belt? Uh, in, in a way, yes, because it uh, stopped a lot of questions by people like you of when are you going to win Le Mans number two. It was a, a, a great race, I think, for us. There's no question about it, having won. But I think just generally everybody, apart from uh, the 
the Peugeot car that finished second. I think everybody actually came away thinking that's one of the classics. And I would say that's one of the things about the last three or four years of sports car racing and also looking into 2011 that uh, we've had some absolutely barnstorming races, fantastic events. And that's not just in LMP with us in Peugeot and Aston Martin, but also in GT as well. And that's the, the area where I, I'm quite excited about going into 2011 because on paper, we've got a new car, Peugeot's got a new car, Aston's got a new car, and uh, we're not 100% sure until we get to that first race where we're all together how it's actually going to, you know, uh, fall out. But right now, you know, when you look at uh, 2008, you have to say that uh, it's definitely one of the best, but that doesn't mean to say that it won't be topped in the future. Do you think the prototype category in sports car racing has got some catching up to do uh, compared with the, the GT ranks? Because GT racing is really, really strong, and all those easily identifiable marks are putting their weight behind sports cars. It's more complicated in prototypes, isn't it? Well, it's more complicated, but I think uh, with the change in regulations, as has been mentioned, it definitely is uh, very exciting for manufacturers. There's quite a lot that are knocking on the door. I noticed yesterday that uh, Honda or Acura in the States have uh, relaunched an LMP1 car. And uh, also that I, I know from Japan that uh, there's some of the markets out there, the, sorry, the car makers out there, that are going to be coming back to Le Mans in the very near future. At the end of it, Winning Le Mans outright is the thing. That's what they want to do because that's the, the worldwide appeal. Uh, in GT right now, it's very, very healthy. There's no question about it. And it is, it's great to see all the brands in there, but I'm sure you're going to see some other ones coming into the top flight of it. Tom, you've won Le Mans eight times. Where do you get the motivation from every June to go back and go as hard as you can for 24 hours? Actually, I, I get this question quite often, but um, it's, 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 it's quite easy to answer. I mean, that is to be a part of a, of a very good team, uh, very good people who likes to do uh, the best, try to do a great job, obviously to being around teammates like Alan and uh, Dindo, who is running around in Milano right now, I'm sure. And uh, th this, is, uh, this is something which is, um, which is really nice. And uh, Le Mans is the hardest race, and you need to to get so much input from um, a lot of people. You need to go through a lot of testing. And obviously, this motivation to do this is, um, is every year as strong as, uh, as strong as ever, trying to deliver um, a good job around a fantastic circuit. Now, something you were telling me upstairs uh, I'm fascinated by. You were an F1 steward, weren't you, last year uh, at the Australian Grand Prix? Did you feel really powerful in that role? <laughs> yeah, did you, want, I, I, did you feel like dishing out endless I, I, punishments? I, I was on crutches, so um, it, it was um, it was a nice. Um, uh, I think, uh, or, or seriously, I think it was a really good thing to put a driver within the within the steward in the steward rooms because um, to have the. Uh, I mean, it just makes the, all the decisions better for for all last year because I don't think uh, with all the drivers who were there, a driver each time. Uh, put in the, um, the knowledge, and uh, there was no driver who could sort of sort of cheat uh, of, um, of what was going on, and it made um, things uh, fair, and it makes uh, made things better for the decision makers. Would you have been much tougher on Michael Schumacher in Hungary than Derek Warwick was? I think he was tough, wasn't it? Wasn't he tough on him? No, he completely got away with it. I think there's a the amount of things that the stewards can actually do. I think that's one area where they're trying to look at at the moment is to, to maybe uh, implement slight changes, what the stewards can do on the day, which was where Derek, I think, uh, came up against. I think his belief of what actually happened and what uh, the stewards can do as a panel maybe were two different things. You obviously raced in Formula 1 with Toyota back in 2002. Um, you and so you keep an eye on what's going on. What do you make of Formula 1 at the moment and what's happening? I agree with, uh, I think it was... Jackie Stewart actually said that the current crop of drivers in the competition is the most competitive ever because, you know, the first time I drove a Formula One car was 1989 and uh, it was when McLaren were in that sort of dominant phase and, and the difference between, you know, first and third and fifth on the grid were seconds. It wasn't tenths of seconds or hundreds. And I don't think uh, we've had any closer racing. I don't think we've had three or four manufacturers uh, up at the front as uh, what there has been in the last couple of years. For me, it's good to see Williams, for example, back you know, fighting in there in the top 10, top eight, top six. And uh, 
with the, the changes that are coming in for next year and tyres and things, it just freshens it all up again. But uh, right now, I would say that driving standard-wise, it is really, really tough all across the categories. And Formula 1 is an example of that. And, uh, you know, I'm quite interested to watch the BBC coverage come the first Grand Prix. Tom, uh, Autosport recently described you as uh, the best driver never to race in Formula 1. Do you, is it something that you regret? I don't mean what we said, I mean never <laughs> racing in Formula 1. <laughs> No, but I mean, obviously, um, it was a nice to, to surprise, obviously, to read that. But I mean, to be in, uh, in to be in Le Mans and uh, to be in Formula One was always my motivation. Since I was a, a small karting driver, there was a motivation trying to, 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 to do the best, to do all the steps from from uh, Formula Ford, so 2000 to, um, to Formula 3 to 3000. And obviously, to get, to get into um, the top ranks. But... Um, it's nothing I regret. I am really privileged to be a part of motorsport for many years, to be with great manufacturers, great teams, great teammates. And obviously at a, at a, at a race like Le Mans, this has been, you can say, my niche. Um, but it, it only has come because the motivation to do well or to succeed or to go to Formula One was all, always there. Um, so it's nothing I regret. I would have loved to have been in, in, uh, in F1. It didn't happen, but therefore, I guess maybe I've been privileged and fortunate to have uh, to have been part of good organizations and been been strong at uh, at Le Mans. Good stuff. Right, let's have some questions from you guys. Anything uh, that we haven't covered? David's here with uh, a microphone. Hands up. Yeah, as drivers, uh, what do you think about the race of champions? Is it something you look forward to or enjoy? Or was it just a big party? The, the race of champions is, is for sure something um, um, I have been part of it for uh, for the last years. It's something you look forward to. It's a purely uh, fun and show until you get the helmet on. Then you want to uh, want to do well. And I think the it has. I have been part of it when it was in Gran Canaria, and I think that was the most relaxed for the drivers' uh, point of view. There was um, maybe a little bit less spectators. There was a little bit less sort of pressure when you take the helmet on because it's still there in a stadium. When you enter a stadium like Wembley, uh, which I, I've been part of, it's, it was, um, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. It's good to see the drivers from different categories, where what you only sort of see on TV or, or, you, or you read ar around. So you see them in, the, in this time of the year. And obviously the fans, it's, um, it's a little bit like here. The show here, you're able to, to go get very close. Everyone is relaxed. It's off season. And that's a little bit the similar situation with the race of champions. So uh, a great event. Alan, did you ever do it? I did it back in Grand Canaria times. And it, uh, the, the memories of that for me was actually seeing it was, it was actually Stig Blomquist in uh, the old Saab Turbo times when I was a kid standing in the forest in Scotland and uh, seeing him coming through and I had a chance to sit with Stig and he went into this sort of hairpin backwards and I thought Christ he's spun and then he sort of just played on the throttle and pulled the front round and, and went on and it was absolutely stunning but I think that's the good thing about it is because you can see people from totally other categories and get in and, and understand a little bit about what they're doing in well, your environment I think well. that was the year when Stig, I, I was there the, the following year and actually they save hotel costs with Stig because he doesn't go to bed at night he, he, st he stays up and then he's still driving brilliantly and winning the next day. That's something um, a which, uh, which thing. Uh, yeah, probably, but <laughs> I have to live up to that. Right, let's have some more questions. Good one about the race of champions, well done. With Le Mans this year, are you scared of the new petrol cars, aka the Aston Martins, um, the Rebellion Toyotas are out for Le Mans by 24 hours this year? Yeah, are you scared of them? Because they're, the, they're trying to get the regulation. They're trying to get parity, aren't they? So the petrol guys have a better chance against I, the diesel I think it's, it's very difficult for the organisers to create parity because it's so many things. It's an engine, it's a chassis, it's a team, it's a driver lineups, it's tyre manufacturers, everything else. But I think uh, looking at the straight line speeds, the Aston had it, especially last year. I remember at Paul Ricard at the first race, and it's got a huge long straight similar to, Ricard, uh, similar to Le Mans length and uh, they were very, very fast, that uh, anything in 
that side going more towards them and less towards us is definitely a fear, there's no question. The one area that I would say uh, we've got a slight advantage is we're out with our car already and testing. And Le Mans seems a long way away in June, but in reality it's not that far away. And uh, Aston are still to get it onto the track, so they're going to be a little bit behind. But you know, you can never ever discount the potential of that team. And Rebellion with the new Toyota engine, you know, that's a package we have to wait and see. I certainly know Toyota's capability of producing engines, and it's, it's a good one, but uh, we'll have to see when it actually hits the track. Okay, let's uh, have uh, one more. Hi, you, uh, would you ever think of doing rallying, you being successful on the track? Sorry, successful on the track, would you ever think of doing rallying Dakar or WRC? Yeah, fancy a bit of rallying? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, I think in motorsport, if you are really um, a true and passionate about motorsport, you want to be versatile. And I think it's great and to be able to explore uh, different kinds of cars, different kinds of technique. Certainly, I myself, I have driven front-wheel drive racing cars, I have driven uh, four-wheel drive racing cars and, and, and being in prototypes, touring cars and, and formula cars. And I have had a T small times I've uh, tried the the rally cars at the race of champions, for example, and it's um, it's uh, it's pretty good. And um, I've left most of them in in the same state as I I got into them with. Not all of them, actually. One time at at the race of champions in um, Stade de France, I was in the final against Sebastian Loeb, and I was in a Citroen, and it was uh, Sarah. And after the race, there was um, my nickname was Sarah Parker. <laughs> Brilliant. Guys, uh, good to talk to you. We're, I know you're both uh, back on uh, later on today, but uh, for the meantime, uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, your appreciation, please, for Alan McNish and Tom Christensen. Thank you.